Well, welcome everybody to our little Easter um, on demand video. And today we have the privilege of being with Dr. Louie. And um, for me, this feels like back in the day when I was at seminary and I went to office hours, I could just shoot the moon with a prof. It's been many, many, many years. So <laughs> this is great to relive that kind of an experience. Today we're going to be talking about Easter. And for us at Trellis, we are on a you know, meet in small groups or invite your neighbors or family over for brunch, um, embodying that concept of the Sabbath. And <clears throat> Anna and I were talking, and at our church, we have the Sabbath Sundays, and we intentionally have decided to not do a traditional type service for these quote unquote big Christian holidays. And, um, some of us have, as we shared this with some friends and family, have um, encountered some shocked responses. <laughs> like, what? You're not doing a big production for Easter? You know, how are people going to be saved? Um, so I think really Ann and I were thinking, you know, what? What, Dr. Lee, do you think causes us to be, you know, the church and Christians to become these people that sort of like hover around big Christian holidays. Like what, what, is, what is the tendency that causes us to do that? And what, is, what are some of the dangers in, mm. in conceptualizing mm. our faith life in, in those mm. terms, mm. you know? Mm. That's a good question. How does it become this way? Yeah. Well, even during the time of uh, the New Testament writings, Paul would say there are some people who take certain days more special and others take, you know, every day the same. And so really during the New Testament times, because it was coming out of, uh, of Judaism and all the feast days, you had this like, we're bringing them in, you know, we got to observe this and then. And in one sense, there's a latitude in this thing, you know, just like there is, uh, there are people that really put a lot of emphasis in this. And then uh, like a trellis, you're not putting emphasis on this. The thing with the Apostle Paul, though, he sees that the people who have who put things in like special days and stuff, they're in the faith, but he, he, he thinks of them in a strange, I don't want to like offend someone, as weaker brethren. Mm. Because they're, it's like they're special occasion type of things. So it's one of these things where it's like, oh, wow, you, 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 you know, you, you're celebrating Easter. You must be of the, of the enemy. You know, it's not, it's not that. It's that, no, you got this latitude. But all in religion and all the different faiths and even Judaism, uh, Old Testament uh, obedience, you had this focus on special days. Uh, in Christ, uh, there was a freeing so that you didn't have to, uh, you know, concentrate on special days. So I think it's part of the default nature of um, humanity mm. to want these things, uh, special occasions. And I think it's also linked to uh, uh, tradition, what we grew up with, but also the fact that, um, and I got to put this right, a form of um, soft legalism. Now, that sounds really offensive. Mm. Where if you go some someplace or do something, that that is like my sort of um, uh, 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 obedience and homage mm. to God, and that's a default sort of a nature of humanity. Tell me where to go. Tell me what to do. Mm. Tell me. Uh, rather than living something. I would tell people it's easier to, you know, go to some event than to actually live out your Christian faith uh, daily in life. So, you know, I most churches will not be like Trellis. I'm speaking uh, at a Good Friday service for another church in San Francisco. And, you know, they don't have Friday night services, but for Easter, they have two Good Friday night two. Friday night services and four Easter services oh, wow. when they usually have two. So, you know, I'm taping for you, for, for you folk that is, has this view of um, Christianity and living in the faith every day. But, 
you know, I'm, I'm also helping out at this other place that is, has this like a, three times the services, right. you know. And, you know, I understand both. I really uh, admire and what I've told my friends to pray about uh, my schedule during the Easter time, I, I tell them, I, if you'd say, which one do I prefer in my heart? I would say trellis mm -hmm. because of the emphasis of living your faith daily. I think it's, it's great that you identify this sort of um, legal, legalism aspect of things, which I think, um, I don't want to say is a default comfort setting for some Asian believers in terms of our influences from our culture, in terms of sort of um, either feeling that we have to achieve certain milestones or do certain things to be like okay in our you know faith and okay in our relationship with Christ. Um, what do you think are some of the you know, the dangers that, you know, we face when we become, you know, soft core legalistic. What are the oh, things that we're missing? It's very dangerous. I have, I fellowship with a lot of people who have children who are older. And I often talk to them about raising kids in the Bay Area, that it's such a, it's very difficult to raise your children in the Bay Area to continue in the faith. Mm. And one of the reasons is, is, is that we have this mentality that if I just find a church and we go regularly, that that's going to make my, my kid yeah. walk in Jesus yeah. while you're influenced by like uh, high tech innovation right. and, uh, and you know, the price of real estate. And, you know, if you work for Google, or Microsoft or Apple, the big, the big three, you know, you're, you, you're doing really well. It's status and uh, emphasis on education, all in, you know, Chinese, uh, Korean, Japanese culture. Uh, and so this is tendency that we'll have all these sort of um, goals that we can benefit from in the Bay Area, but we'll go to church and we'll make sure mm -hmm. we find a good church for you. And, and, and I tell you, the majority of the kids that fall into that sort of uh, description just said, do not walk with Jesus Christ. Not that they will deny the faith, but they do not walk in the faith because it's just something to attend mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, not get in the way of the other things that we can attain to in the Bay, which is education, get a good job, uh, you know, enjoy the area, go skiing, go hiking, you know. And it's really difficult to incorporate and make the faith real for youth and for people because it's easier to attend something than to have your life transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I think you, you make a really good point. And, um, you know, both Anna and I have heard from, you know, parents of young kids in our church where that is a huge concern, right? That, oh. you know, how, how do we make faith applicable into, you know, our daily lives, both adults and children. You know, we, uh, we have many, uh, many uh, series concurrently going on in, for our preaching schedule, <laughs> one of which is going through the book of uh, John. And, you know, what we've been seeing through Jesus's, you know, performing of his miracles is sort of the underlying tone of, you know, where ge geographically Jesus is and like the significance of, how Galilee is kind of similar to the Bay Area in that it's, it's, it's not Jerusalem, right? And so you have all these competing ideologies and thoughts and, uh, you know, mix of peoples and all this coming together. And, and Jesus just sort of being in the center of that, um, blowing things up, right? And what do you think in terms of, you know, being a Bay Area family, um, how do we begin, how do parents begin to make, you know, a relationship with Christ relevant amidst 
all these things, right? Wow. Like, what does what does that even mean? And how do how do we like how do we become more like Jesus in the sense that we're, we're like you know not just trying to bring our faith and and life you know in some parallel thing, but like you know have Jesus just blow it up like he does yeah. in John, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So so. You're talking specifically about the family. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, if, you know, I'm okay, 68, okay? So that's, that's, that's retirement age, but I'm still very active in the faith. But I don't have the stamina to, like, you know, church plant or be pastor full time anymore. But if I did, I'd have such a different church than mm. when I was. I, I pastored uh, over 30 years in different. Uh, cities, uh, uh, 19 years in San Francisco, uh, three years in Palo Alto, six years in uh, Chicago, church planted, an Indian uh, expat church uh, in uh, North San Jose. And uh, so I have a lot of church experience, okay? But if I were to do it again, or if I would start again, hmm. I'd really focus on incorporation of the faith into the family because I see I see this is why I see different churches because right now we're living in an age where it's uh, post-christian and people are just you know moving to the Bay Area looking for church okay mm. they're not it's mm -hmm. like uh, they're not looking for church okay so the churches must find ways to so just just keep afloat because you have people move, leaving out of the area and that, that's sort of like a wow what a burden that is you know and so you have churches that focus on the production, churches that focus on the speaker, like it's a personality. Uh, you have ch churches that fo focus on social justice and what we're going to do a lot of stuff, you know, uh, for the community. Yeah, but you could do all of that and lose all your kids. I'll just tell you that. Mm. All of those things, because those, all these things are like good to have. You can lose all your kids because it's, again, it's something they just attend. Oh, we'll just you know and you know do this thing. You really need to incorporate your faith in the family. Mm. And I'm not talking about like doing devotions, praying, but as my daughter, who was an elder at a at a Presbyterian church, uh, the pastor said to her, "You have to make your faith real, and your children must see your piety." at mm. home, at work. And that's a really important thing. It's not something, oh, you do this, oh, you go here. You must, they must see the mother, the piety in life, praying, doing, compassion, not as an activity, but as a sort of like, wow, mom does that. Mm. And now I, well, I heard that, my daughter, and... Um, Except I said, what a, what a, a nice uh, bit of advice. And so, like, for my daughter, what, what, what she does is that she, she makes sure that the, the climate at home, she has a good uh, witness just as a mother, okay, rather than, okay, did you practice this? Yeah, boom, you know, mm -hmm. type of Asian, you know, uh, a dom and a tiger mom, you know. Uh, uh, but she also, uh, like, she takes my grandson, which is her daughter, uh, uh, her her son, to feed homeless uh, people like every month. Mm. And she makes sure she goes with him and they do it together. And I thought, oh, that's really nice. It's not like a, it's, it's not like a, oh, it's a youth activity, you mm -hmm. know, but the pastors don't, but, mm -hmm. but the parents don't do anything. It's sort of like, hmm, that's really, that's really good. Mm-hmm. Now, there's no guarantee that my grandchildren are going to continue in the faith. It is one of the burdens that I have on my five grandchildren. But, um, you know, it's important that uh, for me that they will continue and they see their faith more than just attending church. Mm. You can't just see faith as attending church. You're mm. gonna, it, it's not going to work out. It must be in the fabric of your life and I think that's what we see in, in John with Jesus like entering into the scene and sort of turning things upside down with sort of Jewish religious 
piety and legalism and all of this and and asking that question of you know what does it really mean to have a thriving connected interactive living relationship with with god and i think you bring out the point i think that's really important where um that reality has to be apparent in the family it's it's not Again, it's not this thing where like, oh, we just throw kids at church and then we hope for the best, right? Or um, we tell them X, Y, and Z are signs of loving God, but we don't practice it ourselves, mm. right? So like having, walking the talk essentially is really important oh. in the family, right? And um, paints that picture of what it means to live out the meaning and the reality of the resurrection every day, daily in our family yeah. lives, right? Yeah. And, you know, um, for people like me who, who love playing uncle and, and are thankful that they don't have their own children, um, you know, that, that applies to, right, in our, in our influence and in our example that we set when we interact with, you know, kids in the family. What would your biggest encouragement slash piece of advice um, be for our families at Trellis as they think about how they're going to discuss, live out, celebrate the resurrection this year for Easter? What, what would your um, encouragement be? Hmm. You know... That's a real loaded question. It is a loaded question. <laughs> because so much of our Christianity is wrapped up in institutionalism, mm -hmm. perception. And then we have our goals in life that for most Christians do not line up with what Christ's goals are for mm. us. And for some erroneous uh, you know, directed pe Christians, they, they think that Christ, living in Christ will help us reach those goals. And uh, that's, uh, well, some, some of you may have that, and that's totally wrong. You know, I, 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 I pastored in a church in, in Palo Alto, and I, I still mentor the, uh, one of the pastors who does the recovery ministry, alcoholics and drug addicts. And he shared with me a few months ago that you know, annually the elders and pastors pray for uh, the congregation, the uh, congregation submits uh, prayer requests. And he said, oh, well, most of the, 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 the prayer requests and family, they, they're, they're asking for their kids to get in college, certain college of their choice. And I responded to my friend Bruce, who I, I said, that's the problem with that church. Mm. That's the most pressing prayer request that my kid gets into Stanford or MIT. I said, no wonder they do not walk in the faith when they graduate. Because mm. if that's the most pressing thing, it's not character, it's, not, it's, it, it's, it's that they achieve the goal of what a Silicon Valley student who lives in Palo Alto goes mm. to Gun High School can get. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're, you're, you're a trellis. If you say what my my goal would be, not that it's not good to go to a good college, mm -hmm. but it's not your goal for your children. Mm. Your goal for your children is they know Jesus Christ and walk in Him. That's your goal. Mm -hmm. And but we get get it all mixed up. And if you make it your goal that my kids walk in Jesus Christ, yeah. And then you begin to like, well, what do I need to do rather than do they attend church and will they get into Stanford? Right. You know, it's like, no, you got it all messed up. You know, it's like you're going to your kids are going to fail because even if they go to church. They're going to see success as attaining what the world standards mm -hmm. is in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. Yeah. You got to be able to assess, evaluate yourself your goals, your motivations, before you even try to do things. Too many Christians, they think it's doing things. So uh -huh. Asian, responsive. If I do things, you know, what are your goals? What makes you tick? 
Mm. What do you want for your children? What would you be most proud of them? You know, I, I would sometimes speak at, a, at, at some bilingual churches and I would always share with them like my story. And I'd say, oh, well, I got two daughters and they both married at 21 and I have five grandchildren and they both went, my daughter went to UCLA and we have family vacations. And then the, the Chinese congregation, they think, oh, wow, you have the greatest life ever because they, that's, <laughs> that's what they want for their family. And then I would tell them, those things are not the most important things is that both my daughters walk in Christ. Mm. It's that there are things that are better and that's Jesus Christ. Mm. I think that's the phrase that we can hone in on. There are things that are better, and that's Jesus Christ. And I think that really is something that, um, you know, for me, for our families, focusing in on that, on that really changes the focus and outlook that we have, right? Rather than being so stuck on, are we doing everything to prepare them to get into Stanford or <clears throat> I went to Berkeley, go Bears, um, right? <laughs> like, but are we, are we instilling in our children a relationship and love for God and <clears throat> relationship with Christ and, and trusting in, in God to bring those other things along with, right? And, and I think that's really important. So thank you for that encouragement and reminder to us that we really... Uh, sometimes we need to like make sure that our head is on <laughs> properly and <clears throat> that we're seeing things um, through the the correct mindset. Um, we're gonna have just this little fun discussion about like your hobby here. So um, I am super like I don't know you're you're way elevated in my mind because I am not handy and I'm a terrible tinkering person. But Dr. Louis, you have converted a van. So tell us a little bit about how this wow. came to be and what is the work that was required and what have you done? Well, this van um, I got uh, at the end of uh, 2023. And it's a 1996 Ford Econoline van. Ooh. So it's, right now it's 28 years old. And so if it was a Toyota, you'd say, oh, it's just broken in. But it's a Ford, so it's like, it's it's like one foot in the junkyard but it was a uh, it was a, a chairlift man for most of its life and so it has low mileage 85,000 miles for 28 oh, years wow. it's like 3 3500 miles a year um and but there was a lot of electrical problems um abs brakes didn't work uh, uh, uh a heater didn't work uh and then there was another problem oh uh the airbags didn't work <laughs> okay so it's sort of safety things it drove and so i spent a month fixing that up and then uh it this van conversion blends my uh tinkering of car repair i, I worked on cars for my adult and also my love for carp carpentry too i was a carpenter when i was in graduate school and so it, you know, I put hardwood floors on, I put plumbing in oh, this wow. thing, I put a sink and, and, and things, and I fixed up the car. I'm very proud of it. Okay. Uh, it's a beast of a, <laughs> and it only gets, I uh, came back, it probably gets on top 14 miles per gallon on the highway going 65 on downhill. But, uh, so it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's not something that uh, Elon Musk will build, okay? Uh, but it's, it's fun and it, it's uh I, I have get a lot of satisfaction on it but it took a lot of time wow so what are the plans for uh taking this beast out well i basically completed it i'm uh just recently uh, the final uh, the sort of the the first uh phase of the of uh the conversion i took it out to sunset beach state park which is in watsonville First state park, uh, reserved a, a site overnight, and then uh, coming back, had a wonderful time there, and then uh, tweaking it some more. Then my son, who lives in Pacifica, will take uh, my daughter and the kids to uh, Pinnacles uh, down south, two hours south, and then uh, in June, uh, four days in uh, Yosemite. Oh, wow. And then I'll be taking it to state parks, tweaking it. And so uh, we we'll hopefully get a lot of mileage on it. 
you know, as long as uh, uh, you know the car uh, is still uh, can run, it, you know, it's going to just be a lot of fun. I, I think I got it with the thought that it would be for my daughter and her husband because he's a real camper, and to bond with the with my with the with their two daughters. Uh, and they love it. They, when they come over, they just playing in the van and stuff like that. They're like, you know, because <laughs> they could stand up in the van. Uh, and so it's just, it's just a lot of fun. It, it just brings the family more together. I, I think in terms of, you know, talking about family and brings up in Christ, one of the things is to be able to enjoy time with your children and grandchildren and not see them as adversaries or, or, or like you're the disciplinarian. Uh, it's like, you know, and just to enjoy, enjoy life. I, I, I think as a follower of Jesus, there's a part of me that also understands the graciousness of God for me to enjoy mm. life and enjoy my daughters and enjoy my grandkids. And I, 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 uh, I was raised by Chinese parents who, old school, you're no good, you don't work hard enough, oh, you're not as smart as your cousin, you know, that type of stuff, you know. And, you know, as a believer, you shouldn't really do that. Yeah. Because, you know, you, 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 you do not provoke your children, okay. And you, you can guide them, but really, you are to show the grace of God to them just as Jesus showed the grace of God uh, to us. Well, thank you, Dr. Louis, for your time and just sharing with us. And um, maybe one day An and I will uh, take some tinkering classes from you because I, I know I'm terrible and uh, need, to <laughs> need to, that would be good. But um, And then everyone, thank you for tuning in and wish you a wonderful time with your family during this Easter as you guys bond and take time to spend with each other.